Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today, along with our students and faculty in what is the heart of our university, the Academy Building. It's probably the first time for us to host the US Attorney General at our university, and definitely so in the company of our Minister of Security and Justice, who's one of, our, of a long line of ministers our law school has produced. This university was founded in 1575 in more or less this very building, and it's one of Europe's leading research-intensive universities. Our motto is Presidium Libertatis, Bastion of Freedom, a key principle that permeates our whole university. As a research university, Leiden plays a key role in both research and teaching. Good academic research and teaching are crucial for a secure, healthy, sustainable, prosperous and fair world. Leiden University is committed to developing and disseminating and applying academic knowledge and we try to be able to be a beacon, a reliable beacon in national and international societal and political debates. And we are about to witness one of these debates on what is definitely a very sensitive issue. I will be brief, since we're all curious to hear from you, Mrs. Lynch, on the important topic of EU and US cooperation in justice. And we're looking forward to your speech uh, but Mr. van der Stuur is going to introduce you and also to give a short speech. So we'd very much like to, to ask him to, do, to take the floor. Um, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure to, to have you and all of you here at attending. And may I now ask you to come forward and take the floor, please. Dear Professor Stolker, dear Attorney General Lynch, or as I would like to say, dear Carol and dear Loretta, dear students and professors, it's great to be here today at my own university, Leiden. And it's more, even more special to be here today in the presence of the US Attorney General. Not only one of the most esteemed lawyers in the United States of America, but ever since we first met also, if I may say so, a close friend. And in the presence of many students who I'm sure enjoy Leiden as much as I did when I was a student here. And sometimes you can even say they enjoy Leiden too much because there are not enough of them here. Um, but that's of course due to the early hours. Today and tomorrow the Netherlands is entrusted with an honorable task. The US and the EU regularly hold justice and home affairs meetings. And as the current president of the EU Council of Ministers, the Netherlands has the honor of hosting it this time. These meetings are part of a tradition that trans transcends us all. They've evolved from the history and the values of the United States and Europe and those values that we share. I'm sure every one of you know beautiful stories about this relationship that stretches over 400 years. We, the Dutch, like to tell stories about New York, the city we always say was used to know as New Amsterdam. We like to remind everyone that uh, the boroughs as Harlem, Brooklyn and Flushing originate from the Dutch cities Haarlem, Breukele and Vlissingen. And we like to tell stories about the Plakkaat van Verlatingen, the Dutch Declaration of Independence of 1581 that may very well have inspired Thomas Jefferson to write his. We tell these stories proudly, but we often forget to remark that we chose to sell New Amsterdam for the salt trade in the Caribbean, losing our chance to own the United States of America. <laughs> But today, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start this lecture by telling a different story. One that is both local and transatlantic. So let me take you back to this place in 1807, a time in which Leiden still did not look a whole lot different from what it is today. The university was already centuries old. Many of the houses that you can see today were already built. And canals like the Rappenburg in front of us and the Steenscheur, not far from where we are now, had been dug ages before. On January 12th of that year, 1807, a vessel carrying thousands of pounds of gunpowder was docked not far from here. Nowadays we would probably say, is this wise? As the story involves, you will hear the answer. Someone decided to cook a fish on the deck of the ship. 
with thousands of pounds of gunpowder in it. And of course, it ignited the gunpowder. The ship exploded. The blast was, he was heard in The Hague and Amsterdam. All over Leiden, windows broke and tiles were blown from roofs. Over 200 houses were destroyed and more than 150 people perish. May perished, many of them, unfortunately, young children that were at school close to where the ship was docked. And one of the victims, ladies and gentlemen, was a professor of Leiden University, and his name was Johan or John Luzak, a historian, a writer, and a scholar of the classical world. But he also was a strong advocate of the American independence and the editor of a journal which was called the Gazette of Leiden an internationally oriented newspaper discussing foreign affairs that was read by John Adams, George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. It was, we could say, the New York Times of the 18th century. And Johann Luzak was acquainted with John Adams, who was the official negotiator and ambassador for the United States in the Netherlands. While Adams lived in the Netherlands, the two often met. They were friends, and together they started a lobby campaign to convince the Parliament of the Dutch Republic to recognize the United States as an independent nation. It took many efforts of these two friends, and it took a declaration of war by the British to win over Parliament. A war, by the way, that the British started after the governor of St. Eustatius in the Dutch Caribbean had been the first to salute an American ship. And on April 19, 1782, the Dutch Republic was the second country in the world to recognize a free, independent, and united States of America. A decision that was then also already based on friendship, but also inspired by a keen eye for strategic partnership. Dutch bankers made financial arrangements to help the young country. And in October 1782, John Adams was present at the signing of an agreement of friendship and trade between the Dutch and the Americans. A beautiful illustration of the long relationship between our two countries, our common history and our common values. And it's in this spirit that we have the honor of welcoming Loretta Lynch and her delegation today here at our university. Tomorrow we will have a program in which we discuss the topics where American-European co cooperation is needed. The Americans and the, United, and the European Union are already working together closely in the field of business, strengthening the rule of law and enforcing the law to protect our citizens from crime and terrorist attacks. This is interesting because it makes our cooperation very broad and diverse. Take, for instance, cybercrime. Criminals and certain activists, sometimes even state-sponsored, exploit the online world. They use it to blackmail people and private companies, to steal valuable technologies, and to get their hands on confidential data from governments, businesses, and citizens. The inherent architectural feature of the Internet is the absence of borders, and that is why we have no choice as countries than to work together more closely. If the criminals don't care about borders, we don't have the luxury of staying on our own turf. That is why we join hands internationally to be effective in upholding the rule of law in the digital world as well. Or take the Caribbean parts of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. I cherish the cooperation between the American and the Dutch jurists and law enforcers. We are facing a joint fight against organized transnational and serious crime and terrorism. And that is why we have to stimulate joint activities to enhance the sharing of information and to strengthen the cooperation in the area of forensics and the organization of the criminal justice system. If the effectiveness of the police, prosecution and judicial services increases, it benefits, benefits us all in every region. Tomorrow, we will reach a milestone in this combat against serious crime because the United States, Aruba, Curaçao, St. Martin and the Netherlands will sign a so-called Memorandum of Understanding, and this will expand and improve our cooperation on law enforcement and the criminal justice system of the Caribbean parts of our kingdom. But ladies and gentlemen, this time round, the American visit is extra special, because what is better than one agreement to sign? We will sign two agreements. Tomorrow, we are also signing another new agreement between the US and the European Union. I won't talk you into believing that this agreement is just as important as the one John Adams and John Luzak propagated in the 18th century. Nevertheless, I do think that both the United States and the European Union can be very proud of what we achieved. Nearly six years ago, the idea was launched 
that the United States and the EU would make an agreement on common principles for the protection of personal data. This was no easy task. The approach in data protection law in the EU and the USA is totally different. The EU data protection framework in the law enforcement sector is shaped by comprehensive data protection guarantees. These are codified in EU primary and secondary law and jurisprudence. In the EU, necessity and proportionality considerations are very important in the determination of restrictions to the rights of individuals. The US data protection guarantees in the law enforcement sector vary according to the legal instruments in place. Under these circumstances, it was a huge challenge to find common ground. But what is impossible in geography had to become reality in legal terms. We had to bridge an ocean. Now, six years later, we can proudly say that an agreement has been reached. This agreement not only establishes a higher level of protection of personal data, it also furthers the cooperation between the US and the EU and its member states when it comes to law enforcement. The agreement as such does not provide a legal basis for the transfer of personal data. It rather serves as an umbrella for existing and future treaties which the United States can, that, with the United States that give a foundation for data transfer. And what's special is that this umbrella agreement provides important additions. It improves the conditions for the processing of transferred data, it supplements, safeguards and conditions, and it enhances individual rights of the persons concerned. It was, ladies and gentlemen, a daunting task, so I would like to congratulate the negotiators who have toiled on the text for many years. And as President of the Council of Justice and Home Affairs Ministers, I welcome this agreement. It will be an honour to sign it on behalf of the Council of Ministers, and I hope that it will meet a favourable reception in the European Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very eager to hear the US Attorney General Loretta Lynch speak about these and other efforts as well. So let me close by mentioning John Adams and John Luzak once again. Luzak died in a terrible blast not very far from here, but his ideas still live on. And if you are curious, you can have a look in the John Adams Library, where many of Luzak's writings can be read online. And somewhere in this library, you may also find the words Adams wrote just before he died, about his memories to the Dutch Republic, in, and in which he applauded its achievements in the field of letters, science, and trade. He wrote, the ancient Greeks themselves never surpassed the Dutch, except, he added, in matters of taste. <laughs> I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that when he wrote this, McDonald's had not conquered the world yet. <laughs> the relationship between the United States and the Netherlands is built on historical ties, shared values, friendship, and mutual trust. The cooperation between the EU and the USA is built on the fact that we are determined to safeguard our freedoms. Freedoms that we have fought and died for in the past, and freedoms we are prepared to fight and die for in the future. Attorney General Lynch, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, all. Good morning to the faculty and the administrators of this wonderful university. Thank you so much for this warm welcome. Uh, to my friend and colleague, Minister Art van der Stoer, thank you for your hospitality, for your outstanding leadership, and also for your partnership in over the past several years, even before I assumed this chair, in our ongoing efforts to promote the shared law enforcement goals of the Netherlands and the United States. And let me also thank, of course, the heart of this university, the students of this university, the beating heart of a great institution. You are carrying on an outstanding tradition of research, of learning, of questioning, and of exploring your values. And I thank all of you for being here today. I'm so pleased to be here. I will share with you, however, the one matter of slight disappointment, which I've already shared with the minister, because you see, I was promised rain. Now, he's assured me he may be able to pull this off, possibly by mid-afternoon or the evening. 
I, of course, am convinced that this glorious weather that I see today is actually the norm for the Netherlands, and it's just a well-kept secret designed to hide this pearl of Europe from the rest of the world. But your secret is out. You have been discovered. We are delighted to be here today, and I hope that this is the first of many visits to come. So I'm so pleased to visit this venerable institution. Leiden University has done so much in its history to advance the ideals of liberty and justice and equality that truly define our nations. And you're not just a place of learning and intellectual rigor, but you are a place of intellectual freedom and exploration. And in a world that often demands instant answers, you provide a place where ideas can be debated, where ideas can be tested, and where the questions themselves have the value that is in fact the basis of true learning. You've educated Nobel laureates, world leaders, from the brilliant scientist Enrico Fermi to, of course, United States President John Quincy Adams, and of course, Minister Van der Stur himself. You've been home to mathematicians like Descartes, artists like, like Rembrandt, philosophers like Spinoza, and those who have studied and taught within these walls within this bastion of freedom, as it is known, have developed ideas and spread principles that have, in fact, illuminated the world. And in fact, in the headquarters of my own office, in the Department of Justice in Washington, DC, we have a series of murals painted during the Great Depression by some of the outstanding artists of our day, of our country. And one of those murals depicts one of your most distinguished alumni, Hugo Grotius. I don't know if you were able to see that, Minister Van der Stur, when you were here. He, in fact, is at one of our most prized places in an area which we call our Great Hall, where we hold important events, and he adorns the staircase of that Great Hall. He is a reminder every day to all of us who work within our Department of Justice of the principles of international law that have formed the basis of cooperation between the Netherlands and the United States and in fact serve to inspire and illuminate the world. Now that cooperation does indeed have a long and fruitful history, dating all the way back to 1782 and earlier. And it, of course, as has been noted, the Republic of the Netherlands became one of the first nations in the world to recognize the young United States during our fight for independence. And of course, it is truly at those moments when true friendships are indeed forged, at a time when no one knew the result of the great American experiment of democracy, when no one could predict whether a fledgling country would founder or would in fact thrive, the Netherlands reached out a hand in friendship and in shared values, values that live on today. And shortly after this, our ambassador to The Hague and friend to the Netherlands, John Adams, wrote, we shall have in this nation, if I am not infinitely mistaken, a faithful and affectionate ally. And of course, he was far from mistaken, because for more than two centuries, the Netherlands and the United States have, in fact, stood firmly together. And it is not just out of a calculation of mutual interests, but out of a common concern for the rights of humankind. We, in fact, are bound together by our common dedication to individual freedom, to representative government, and to open markets. These have stood us in good stead as countries and as allies for over 200 years, and they define us. These bonds, the bonds of allies that are nurtured through mutual prosperity, generate strength to sustain us against common enemies. And the bonds of allies also allow countries even to disagree and to come, if not to mutual accord, then to mutual respect and understanding. And of course, the challenges of the modern era call upon all of us to lean upon those bonds as never before. And indeed, the strength of our bond and our ongoing commitment to international justice and law is more vital now than at any time in recent history. And we look over the last several decades, we have seen wonderful technological innovation. It has offered opportunities to bring people and nations together. Indeed, as they say, the world is now flat. But it has also created significant new challenges to law enforcement. Violent ideologies can spread and proliferate. 
Threats are no longer contained by borders and oceans, and adversaries are as likely to be found in cyberspace as on the battlefield. Now today, the evolving and the increasingly transnational threats from terrorism, human trafficking to cybercrime and corruption require ever closer international cooperation, especially among nations like ours with historic relationships and especially among nations like ours with shared principles. And in a world that is more interconnected and interdependent than ever before, it is absolutely critical that we work together to uphold the norms and the statutes that keep our citizens safe, that keep our countries secure, and that keep our economies fair and open. And I'm incredibly proud to say that the Department of Justice, and indeed the entire Obama administration, is determined to stand alongside our allies, in fact, to lean on our common bond as we seek to create a stronger and a safer world. We are working every day with organizations such as Interpol and Europol to counter terrorism and violent extremism. And these efforts range from sharing information, vital in this day, to offering technical support. They range from providing investigative law enforcement overseas here, and in fact, almost a decade ago, we joined our fellow members of the G8 to create the 24-7 Cyber Network. The Cyber Network is a rapid reaction system that has grown to include more than 70 countries, and it provides the international community with an effective and an innovative tool for addressing a wide range of cross-border crimes. And we've also worked with partner nations under the auspices of the European Cyber Crime Center, what we call EC3, to dismantle illicit online marketplaces that traffic in narcotics, that traffic in firearms, stolen personal information, other illegal goods, and of course, human beings. And of course, as the host country of so much of this effort, the host country of Europol, a member nation of Interpol, and a party to the, Bu the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, the Netherlands is at the heart of these and so many other collaborative efforts to meet the unique law enforcement challenges of the 21st century. And this is particularly true in the struggle against international corruption. And thanks to the aid of your public prosecution service, and with the assistance of a number of other law enforcement agencies throughout Europe, the Justice Department has entered into a criminal resolution in February of this year with Vimpelcom. Vimpelcom is the world's sixth largest telecommunications company, and they have admitted to conspiring to offer more than 114 million US dollars in bribes to a government official in Uzbekistan. And under the terms of our resolution, Vimpelcom has agreed to pay the US government a penalty of more than 230 million US dollars. And of course, under a separate agreement with the Public Prosecution Service, Vimpelkrom has agreed to pay a sum of the same amount to the government of the Netherlands. Because corruption affects us all. Together, our coordinated cases and the work that we did together to build the case and generate this resolution sent a clear message that bribery is not a victimless crime and that both of our governments intend to ensure fair competition, we intend to ensure equal opportunity, and we intend to ensure that for people around the world. Because if markets are not free and fair and open for all of us, then they're free and fair and open for none of us. And tomorrow, as been noted, we will again set pen to paper and illustrate the close relationship of the United States and the Netherlands and other countries and the European Union. We will be signing two agreements that demonstrate again what we do together. And I thank the minister here, not just for his comments today, but for the work that he has done over the past several years to make these agreements a reality. They are on paper, but they simply reflect the longstanding and in fact hard fought work and connections that our two countries share. I of course do refer to the memorandum of, of, of understanding between the U.S. Department of Justice, the Ministry of Security and Justice of the Netherlands, and the Justice Ministries of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin that will deepen our law enforcement cooperation in the Caribbean. And let me again thank Minister Van Stuyver for his vital role in making this important agreement possible. 
and I think it is only fitting that it is during the Dutch presidency of the European Union that we will be signing the second agreement referenced today, the Umbrella Data Protection Agreement, which shows our joint commitment to protect both the safety and the privacy of our citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, as these agreements show again, the work between our countries, between the United States and the Netherlands, has already resulted in groundbreaking programs and vital accomplishments. And that work has been guided by the democratic ideals that have defined our people for centuries. And those ideals will continue to light our way forward in years to come. It is strengthened by the alliance that has drawn our nations together since America was born. And when we look at the Netherlands, at this beautiful country, we look, of course, at your motto, which we translate into English as, I will uphold. And I want you to know that as we go forward today, together, our message together is not just I will uphold, but we will uphold. Together, we will uphold the rights of our citizens to live lives of opportunity and of meaning. And we will do our part to secure those rights for the citizens of all nations. We will uphold the rule of law in both of our countries, and we will do our part to promote the rule of international law around the world. We will uphold the centuries-long relationship between our nations, and we will do our part. We will do everything we can to foster cooperation among all nations today and far into the future. So as I close, let me thank the people here the students, the faculty, indeed this great country for being a part of that shared work. Thank you for all of your efforts to expand our knowledge and our liberty. Thank you for letting me spend a few minutes with you today and for welcoming me to your university and to your country. But most of all, thank you for your commitment, not just to the rule of law, but to the view that all people deserve the benefits of that law as we work together to make freedom and equality a goal, something that is held in the hand of every human being. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Attorney General and Mr. Minister, for your eloquent and so inspiring uh, addresses to us uh, today. We feel very privileged that you have come to pay a visit to our university on the eve of the conclusion of such important uh, agreements uh, and to celebrate the Dutch-US uh, relationships. We, uh, our university, uh, cherishes its own relationship with the US academia, which dates back already with exchange agreements to 1924, so we feel very privileged to continue that exchange today. And we have our students who are very eager to ask you their uh, questions. I will uh, pass the microphone to them in yes. turn. They will introduce themselves to you and ask them your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Morning. thank you very much for uh, taking time to be here today um, and saying yeah, your lovely addresses to us. Uh, my name is Michelle Verhey. I'm uh, from the Netherlands. I'm a, a master student in public international law here at Leiden Law School. Um, and I, I was hoping to ask you uh, a question that perhaps both of you could answer, um, namely, uh, which aspects of the um, either United States or the Dutch criminal legal system um, are you most proud of, and which aspects would you find most suitable? to be exported to other criminal legal systems? And perhaps are there any lessons that the Dutch or the US criminal legal systems could learn from one another? Uh, one another? Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, and thank you so much for that question. Um, I will have to say that when, when people ask which part of the American criminal justice system are we mo am I most proud of, there's a lot to review. 
We certainly have our challenges and we are working to improve our system, but I think that what I am most proud of is a principle that dates back to our founding and in fact to our Constitution, which is uh, essentially the issues of access to justice and the guarantee of a fair trial for everyone who endures that particular, uh, that particular situation. That is something that is a bedrock of our judicial system. Um, and I think that it's important for those of us in the U.S. not to claim perfection uh, as we try and work within our system, but to understand that it's a goal that we strive for with every case that we bring and in every matter that we investigate, to make sure that those individuals who are brought before us for charges have access to justice, which is, of course, a fair and open court system, which is also access to representation that is efficient, that is effective, um, and that will, affect, in fact, stay with them throughout the process. So that's probably what I am most proud of, because even though I've been a prosecutor for over 20 years, uh, unless there is, in fact, that access to justice for those who are charged with law, uh, it's very difficult to ensure the fundamental fairness of the American system. Um, certainly, I would say that we are trying to advance that principle as we work with other countries and build capacity, but we're also looking to make sure that we expand it within the United States to make sure that individuals who are in the, in the legal system for civil matters also have access to justice. Uh, we're recognizing the importance of that as a way to ensuring not just freedom and fairness in the criminal system, but really throughout all the ways in which the legal system interacts with our citizens. Well, on behalf of the Netherlands, I, I can say, of course, I share the idea that the, the utmost importance of the principles, uh, access to justice, fair trial, mm. um, even though we, we take different views on that, on the way in which we developed it in the, mm. in the, in the, coming, in the past years, centuries, uh, but I think these principles are the same. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, those are the principles that even can still be shared with, as an example, with other countries elsewhere in the world. But for the Dutch position, I think that we are most, I am most proud of the fact that we have changed in the past couple of years the position of victims in our system. Um, in the old days, uh, victims did not have any place in, in any criminal uh, proceedings. Uh, they were there, and, and, and because they were there, there was a criminal problem anyway, but they didn't have any position, they weren't informed, uh, they weren't a part of it, they couldn't speak, uh, so they were basically um, uh, not in any position um, uh, and, and I think that we've realized in the past couple of years that victims are human beings too and that they do have rights, that they do have an interest in the criminal proceedings and the fact that we have strengthened their position also uh, by allowing them to speak um, uh, quite recently by allowing them to speak liberally. They can say anything they want. In the old, a couple of years ago, they couldn't. Um, and I'm very proud that uh, as a member of parliament, but also as the Minister for Security and Justice, I've been able to make a, a, a tiny bit of difference in this respect. Thank you. Perhaps it's also proper to mention now that this bedrock principle of access to justice, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, fundamental principle that you refer to, will be actually shared uh, under the umbrella agreement that is to be concluded. And, and that, that umbrella agreement makes it possible for EU citizens yes. to bring their cases to US courts. So I think that's a very important uh, development yes. uh, in this context. Yes, and something which is also very special because it yes. only concerns US cit EU citizens. Yes. So there are no other citizens that have any uh, judicial redress, as the act is called, in the United States, except for the EU citizens. So it gives us all a very proud feeling that we have something special. <laughs> thank you. Let's perhaps turn to the next question. Yes, thank you. First, I would like to thank the Dutch Minister of Security and Justice and the Attorney General of the United States for their time and, and also the uh, kind words about Leiden and the Netherlands in general. I'm Rhys Bain, I'm a Dutch law student here in Leiden, not in my master phase yet, but I will be there quite soon, I hope. Uh, I have quite a long question, so I'll look down a couple of times to check what, what it is. But I have a question specifically on the, um, the, the policy on soft drugs in the United States. In the Netherlands, we have a uh, a, a, a policy where we tolerate the use of soft drugs. It's called a gedoogbeleid in Dutch. Um, my question is, um, how, um, how, what is your view on uh, the different levels? Because of course, a couple of states have recently uh, legalized uh, the use uh, of soft drugs. Uh, what is the um, 
the federal approach to this issue and uh, are there tensions between the federal level and the state level on this issue? Okay. Quite a long question. No, that's, our, that's, uh, that's quite all right, but certainly I think it um, points at a number of, of important issues that we are grappling with in the American justice system now, which is how do we go about ensuring the protection uh, of everyone, particularly when it comes to the violence that is still unfortunately associated with our drug trade, uh, while also not stigmatizing individuals who are the end users of drugs um, of, of various types, in particular um, there's, there's a host of issues that we're recognizing now, particularly with our heroin and opioid epidemic, that we need to have a public health approach to those issues to ensure treatment. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in the U.S. overall, I would say, before I get to the issue of the state and federal system, is we are in fact moving to, toward a view that I think is generally extremely healthy, which is we are looking at the different levels of drug use and trying to find the different different types of harms generated by those different levels and deal with them accordingly, as opposed to having a one-size-fits-all large hammer that falls on everyone. So for example, you will see that what we're spending a great deal of time on in our federal system is looking at the issue of low-level, nonviolent uh, drug offenders. Uh, these can be individuals who are addicted and their, their crimes of, of various types are a result of addiction, or they themselves are involved in, in drug distribution, but again, they are not major players, and in fact, um, they, are ge they are generally there because they themselves have a problem with drugs, and making sure that we deal with them in a way that holds them accountable, but also provides for treatment options and provides for ways to deal with the underlying issues that drive them uh, to the substance itself. Uh, and we are, we are looking to reserve our more serious enforcement actions toward the large-scale traffickers who still, unfortunately, generate a great deal of violence uh, wherever they go and also through money laundering activity uh, weaken and subvert our financial system. Um, it's similar, I think it's a slightly different issue in, in the state system because our states are able to have different laws, um, all 50 of them, as how they deal with narcotics and a number of states have moved towards legalization of certain types of substances, usually marijuana, not the substances that are caused that are so devastating like heroin and cocaine, uh, either for medical purposes and or sometimes for recreational use. So there'll be different ways of dealing with that at the state level as well. Um, but we, we still retain, however, at the federal level, a grave concern over the levels of violence that trafficking in those substances can generate. And so where there is a state system that does provide for more leniency, we look at areas such as um, those from other states who may come who may come into one state to buy a substance they can't buy next door. Is that generating a crime problem in the other state? We look at situations where people are driving under the influence, and we really focus our efforts at looking at situations where children are allowed to obtain these substances because they're not intended for children under any of the, of the regimes. So we're, we're trying to have a situation where the states have their regulatory system. We still retain the federal interest um, where problems will cross state borders and in fact generate those large levels of violence. But it's, it's a bit of a patchwork in the United States right now. So federally, uh, we have in fact maintained a strong enforcement posture at that level. Uh, we also, in addition to our states, have large numbers of uh, Native American reservations. Um, that will that have uh, that are looking at different ways of dealing with different types of substances, and so we're trying to work with them to maintain a system that's respectful of their system, but also lets us protect the federal interests that are involved. Thank you. I think the idea of a patchwork, in a way, we have of course similar uh, experiences in the EU, where sometimes the question is, uh, to what extent should something is something the prerogative still of states or EU? So this this tension that you have between federal and state level, mm -hmm. we experience it perhaps also uh, in the EU in different settings, but still there can be also to go back to the first question, yes. some shared experiences, lessons learned also to that uh, dynamic. Um, so perhaps we turn to the third uh, question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Manuela Rueker and I'm from Switzerland, but also a student here at Leiden University at the Master Degree of Public International Law. And um, I would like to ask you a question concerning cybercrime, and I will direct that more to Mr. Van der Stur. I hope I said it correctly, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, 
So, while private cybercrime is generally addressed by criminal law and cooperation, and state cyber attacks are governed by international law and policies, to what extent is this dichotomy still valid, or do we need more integrated approaches in counter cybercrimes and attacks? Well, thank you very much for your question. It's not something cybercrime um, in all its forms. And uh, in a couple of years ago, we still had a, um, a strong distinction between cybercrime and cybersecurity. Cybercrime, on the one hand, being uh, criminals who try to obtain money or sell drugs uh, through uh, cyberspace, and cybersecurity was an issue of how do we protect our vital um, uh, systems in our country uh, from attacks from other um, uh, countries or terrorist organizations. So we had the distinction between the two. Uh, the past two or three years, we see that that distinction actually doesn't exist. So there's the first problem that we are facing is that because terrorist organizations either use criminal uh, for criminal intent, with criminal intent, use cyber, uh, or they use it as to means to attack a country, which is cyber security. So crime and security basically has become one and the same problem. And um, the interesting question is that the all the, the ancient legal uh, frameworks that we have, the idea of um, any, every country uh, has its own prosecution system and, is, and that's uh, competent to prosecute criminals in the specific country when they have committed a crime in that country. And the old, in the old days, you couldn't commit, if you committed a crime in Belgium or in the United States, we couldn't do anything about it in the Netherlands because it was a problem addressing the United States. Um, but now with cybercrime, what we see and, and that's, of course, is also the nature of your question. What we see is that cyber criminals uh, can, w um, can live in Uzbekistan, uh, can use servers which are placed in uh, Russia, in uh, Singapore, or in uh, Chile, and they attack people in the Netherlands, in the United States, and in Switzerland. And then the interesting question is, uh, who is going to prosecute where? Which judge is competent? So that's one of the priorities of the EU presidency. We have discussed uh, this issue with our fellow ministers, and, um, and basically agreed um, that we need to look uh, into a system where borders uh, are, not any, are not an issue anymore when, you, when we are combat, combating cybercrime. And having said that, it's the, the area of discussion behind it is huge, because what are we going to do then if we accept borders to be irrelevant or even a problem in itself, uh, if we are, want to be effective against cybercrime? What are we going to do then? So that's a discussion that we didn't reach an agreement on within uh, the half year that we were the president of the EU, but it's a discussion that we have started and that we're certainly going to move on because it's simply a fact um, that we need to have more powers, more possibilities, but also other ways, new ways of thinking in order to be effective against cybercrime. Yes, it's a challenge also for academia to Absolutely. Uh, follow the developments as rapidly as they uh, happen. Uh, and to transcend even not only states and, and perhaps ministries, but also departments within the university, so the Department of Criminal Law and International Law, we always also must work more together to deal with those issues. Yes, also and, and to add to that, one thing, of course, in, in, uh, we are proud of a lot of things in the Netherlands, and we are proud of our industrious way of working. We are less proud of our role in the soft drugs manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, but we are also very proud of the fact that we are one of the most internet-based countries in the world, which also at the same time means that we are probably one of the most uh, one of the countries that's most used by criminals to uh, for cybercrime purposes. We know that our server capacity is huge compared to many other countries, but at the same time that also means that we have we have to do something about it ourselves as well. We are doing that, but we are faced with uh, with interesting challenges in that field. Thank you. Perhaps we turn to the next uh, question. Good morning, my name is Mary Malawi. I'm a student of international law at Lady University as well. Uh, my question is for Ms. Lynch. Uh, last December, Mr. Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative visited Leiden Law School and he gave us insights into the US legal system, especially into the role of legal aid clinics supporting, for instance, uh, individuals on death row. So I'd like to ask you if you could share with us your views on the death penalty and how it's being implemented in the US. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that uh, Brian Stevenson was able to visit with this university, um, and he certainly is one of the leading experts and thinkers in this field. 
Um, I also claim a bit of personal pride since he and I went to law school together. Uh, and we are, we are, in fact, law school classmates. And he has devoted his life to the pursuit of justice and making sure that those individuals uh, who many people in, in, in any legal system would deem not necessarily worthy of review get the review and, in fact, the access to justice that I was mentioning earlier that every defendant deserves. And so he has, uh, he is, he's well known for saying that um, all of us are more than the worst thing that we have ever done. And that is how he views the work that he's done. I think it's an important voice in, in the thinking on not just the death penalty, but the criminal justice system overall. So the death penalty in the United States is another situation where we have, we have interla interlocking levels of jurisdiction. There's a federal system for the death penalty, and then every state um, has or is able to have their own uh, state authorized death penalty as a potential penalty. And not all of our states do. Um, in fact, that number changes over time. And one of the things that, ten that influences our Supreme Court when they are looking at various challenges to the federal death penalty statute, either its application to individuals of a certain age or, um, or certain issues, is how the matters are being handled in the states. And so I think you see a time in the U.S. where there's a great deal of thought being given to how the death penalty is in fact used. Um, it is, of course, the ultimate penalty um, as a prosecutor. And in the federal system, we use it more rarely, but we do use it. Uh, and we have a fairly strict set of protocols for determining, first of all, even if a statute provides for that particular penalty, does the case in fact call for it? And even if the case calls for it, has it met all the criteria and are there any mitigating circumstances? But I can certainly tell you that uh, as a prosecutor, it is one of the most difficult decisions that any prosecutor will face as to whether or not to consider reaching for that penalty. And that's just within the federal system. The state systems, again, as I'm sure you heard from Brian, um, have different ways of dealing with this. The concern with any penalty from which there is ultimately no recourse, such as the death penalty, is can we in fact carry it out in a way that is fair and equitable and does not carry within it uh, certain levels of bias or unfairness that make it inappropriate, no matter how difficult or how bad or how harsh the case. Uh, and that, that's been the challenge for the United States. Certainly with a number of organizations, not just Brian's but others, where many of the state systems have not been as effective or efficient as fair as we would have liked, some states have changed their laws. Uh, and so we now are seeing a shift in thinking in the United States on this. And it continues to come up through our court systems. It continues to be a way, uh, something that we look at and we refine. I think it continues to be a way in which uh, we, we reflect our views uh, on crime and punishment at the deepest, deepest level. Thank you. Um, we will now uh, pass to the one but last question. I think there's one more question here. Um, good, after, uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Still. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm also a master student of public international law. And my question is regarding the cooperation treaty. So it's uh, mainly addressed to Mr. Van der Stur. Um, um, it is um, given, like given the legal differences of the Dutch system as well as the U.S. system, where do you see the limits of cooperation? And here, I think, especially of the European Convention on Human Rights, and as well of the situation of Guantanamo detainees right now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's first say that it's um, there's no doubt that almost every country in the world has different differences, uh, either in opinions or in the way the legal system works. And of course, the same is true for the United States and the Netherlands, and the same is true for the European Union and the United States. Um, but I think that uh, if we look at the, the challenges we're facing in, in all sorts of uh, areas, it's not the differences that we need to look at, but it's uh, where we are united and where we are the same and similar. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing tomorrow with the agreement. We uh, fully realize that it's of the utmost importance to share information, even if it's information that is considered to be part of the privacy of our citizens, um, in order to safeguard the security of our parts of the world, maybe uh, the world as such. So the agreement we're reaching tomorrow is, is about how do we ensure that information is shared in such a way 
uh, that it's in um, that it's it takes into account all the, the rules and regulations that we mutually have, and at the same time uh, prov uh, provides for safeguards for our population if information is shared. And that's a discussion uh, which is uh, which has taken us a very long time, six years uh, to reach you. You could also say, why six years? Because the problems we face are urgent, so let's do it fast. But it's exactly that we needed six years because there are differences and because there are concerns mutually. Um, so that's one of the things that we, uh, that's the reason why it took so long, and that's the reason why it's an agreement that has um, a wonderful balance between privacy on one side and the security of our people in the other, on the other side. The, the, then you raised the, the, the point of uh, Guantanamo Bay. I think that uh, it's very clear that even, although we understand where, the, where Guantanamo Bay came from, and although we understand that um, uh, in the situation where we were, were in, after 2001, after the horrendous attacks at New York, um, things needed to be done. Uh, we have also, the Dutch government has always said that um, we are against a facility like Guantanamo Bay. It's the thing that we've discussed together. It's not a surprise for the Attorney General that, that I say so, and all my predecessors and her predecessors have discussed it in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. That's also part of our friendship, that if we disagree on the issues, we can discuss it, and that we, um, we are open and frank about it. Um, on the other hand, um, now uh, we see a wonderful and a very important move from the United States towards closing uh, Guantanamo Bay, and that's exactly the same, uh, and that's why we as the Netherlands government have said uh, we support that because we supported ending it anyway, um, but we want to see real tangible, uh, effectual uh, move towards um, uh, bringing those detainees to trial who should go to trial and releasing the others, and if we see such a movement then we are uh, also prepared to do our to do our thing to do our best as we have been requested by the U.S. government. So that's uh, that's our position on this this very difficult issue. Thank you very much. Maybe we move to one more question. Yeah, thank you. In his introduction, uh, Minister Van der Sleur spoke about the umbrella agreement that will be signed tomorrow. Um, what will because we spoke about what it, it means in general, but what will the practical implications be for EU and U.S. citizens? And uh, Ms. Lynch, what is your view on the future of EU and US cooperation on the field of data security? Okay. You first? Right. Sorry. Whatever. Uh, well, why don't we, we, I think we shall share this one. They're very good. Uh, as we've shared so many. And we'll speak at the same time, yes. simultaneously, just to make it a little bit more exciting. I think we should do that. <laughs> I, I think that uh, I'd like, I'd like to, to build upon the minister's last answer to answer the, the second part of your question, the future of U.S. and EU cooperation on data issues, uh, which is that even where we have differences, uh, because of the strength of our relationship, we have a pathway to discussion. And that discussion usually generates a result. And I think we all of us can look to examples in our daily lives of situations where you start out with, with someone with, with very strongly held views on a particular issue, and you think that there perhaps is no way to reconcile uh, an issue and, and that the tension is going to rule the day. But once you move away from focusing on the tension and focus on what do you have in common and what are your common goals, um, then pathways begin to emerge. And I also think that it's important, certainly from the U.S. perspective, um, and we, we have worked very hard, particularly in this area, to listen to our colleagues and counterparts and listen to their concerns. And we also have to be very open that the U.S. Is, does not contain the only answer to all solutions. Um, and so with that attitude, we're able to say, or, or to look at the concerns and say, well, if in fact U.S. law does not, does not meet those concerns, are there, are there things we can point to that do answer concerns? And in fact, do we need to change U.S. law, which we actually did in order to make this umbrella agreement a reality? We, we have spent a great deal of time working on our own internal issues, uh, making sure that our politicians understood the importance of the privacy issues and concerns raised by our European counterparts, and that it was not simply um, a, a, a difference uh, without a distinction or a difference uh, to be contrary, but it reflected very real concerns that in fact were concerns that were similar to ours. We all share the, the, the goal of privacy. We all share the goal of security, of not just personal data, but, but, of, but of the things that make everyone unique. And so if you take the view that there can be more than one way to achieve the same end, then all manner of possibilities open up. And I think that this umbrella agreement 
by example will lead to other agreements, either in fact or in principle, along those same lines. That where we have been sort of at a log jam in ways in which we perhaps haven't even seen yet, whether it's an individual case or a larger principle, we'll be able to look at this and say, we were able to resolve this larger issue and provide a framework for discussion and a framework for sharing information safely and securely. If we can do it here in an area that's at one of the heart of what's important to both countries, we can do it in other areas. Yes, I, I would like to underline what the Attorney General said in this respect. Um, and it's, it's indeed, it's remarkable that um, as part of this agreement, as part of the discussion on the sharing of information on the one hand and the data protection on the other side, that indeed the United States took uh, the step of having the Judicial Redress Act, where US, EU citizens can actually have a, um, a discussion on what happened with their data in the United States, um, realizing at the same time that um, uh, it's of vital importance to be able to exchange information with the United States. And of course, it has to be said that we, uh, the Europeans have also learned from the United States. The United States has, a very, on a very uh, early moment, realized that it would be very important for the safety of their own uh, country to be able to know uh, which kind of people are flying into their country. So they have had a system of PNR records, a system where your names and you, everybody, who's, everybody who has ever flown to the United States, you know you have to fill in a lot of forms and, and, and even sometimes I think it was it was skipped now, but you even have to to, uh, to answer questions whether you were part of the Holocaust and so on. So which is which is quite an interesting to, thing to do if you realize how long ago that was. But it's um, but it's but the idea behind it is that the United States realized in a very early moment that it would be important to know who is entering our country. To be honest, in Europe, we have thought for a very long time that it's uh, that this was not important, that we would have other systems that would work. And to be honest, we have to say that as a result of the Paris attacks, as a result of what we've seen in Brussels, um, that even now the member states do realize that having some form of information about who flies into your country, who travels into your country, uh, who travels within the EU, uh, because that's exactly what uh, terrorists uh, are doing, um, in order to, to, be, to remain unseen, and that we now have a system in place which we call the PNR system, Passenger Name Record System, which will be in place in the next two years. It will still take a very long time. But we finally realize that this is important. And to be honest, um, uh, we should have learned a little bit earlier from the United States, because they were right. Thank you. I'm very proud of our uh, students for asking uh, such uh, interesting and very good uh, questions. As said, we are very grateful that you have uh, come here to share with us your views, uh, your perspectives, your experience in particular. And, and, and in particular, I think the lesson uh, that uh, how the, the, the values that we all share and the principles, how they may meet political realities and how it may be that even if we share values, uh, the way we share them uh, might differ, there may be differences in balancing different interests um, uh, and how through dialogue ultimately we can come closer together and we can effectuate the lessons learned uh, idea. So as I said, uh, we are very grateful to be able to offer our students in particular, but probably all of us, the academic community, those insights uh, uh, and to be able to have this, this meeting with you and we are very honoured uh, that, as I said, at the eve of those important uh, moments you came here to share uh, this with us. I will now pass the floor to our rector to close uh, the ceremony. Well, thank you so much. It was actually a very cute picture, the two of you in that <laughs> academic box. I think we, we have some, some wonderful pictures of it. It represents definitely a very good relationship between the two nations. Thank you very much for coming to Leiden and, um, and for your very open debate with the students. We are very happy with that. I'm also grateful to Larissa and her students. Good questions. I'm grateful to the audience. And I would now like to, to invite you to the meet and greet. Um, it's somewhere down, down the hall. Um, where you can probably meet also with the minister, the two ministers. Um, once again, thank you very much um, for coming and have a nice day. The weather really helped. Glorious weather. It's not <laughs> going to rain today. I'm sure it's going to rain tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.